talk about uh, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. This is part five. Greg, wants to tell us about the videos you're going to watch. Yeah, this is the remainder of the video. This is direct and cross and redirect in the defense side for Heard and for Depp. And there's a lot in here. And we'll talk about how they're trying to impact the jury and how they're prepared. Amber, other than the threats that you've described, what other threats have you endured since the Depp Waldman statements were made? I receive hundreds of death threats regularly, if not daily. Thousands since this trial has started people mocking, mocking my testimony about being assaulted, making fun of my... Objection relevance, non-responsive. What's the damages? You can continue. It's been agonizing, agonizing, painful, and the most humiliating thing I've ever had to go through. I hope no one ever has to go through something like this. I just want Johnny to leave me alone. I just want him to leave me alone. I've said that for years now, and I thought he would after 2000. Non responsive. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so we will use occasionally on this show a lot of jargon. So we're going to be careful not to use a lot of jargon to unpack some of the dense concepts that we talk about. But in this one, we don't need a lot of jargon. I'm going to tell you that she, her head is like it's on a switch, and she's got a little limit switch right here. And when she looks at the jury, her face changes from what it is when she's looking at the attorney. So we'll call that a swivel switch, just my own made-up word. If she does that, she changes her face. That's okay, except remember, people who are in the jury are human beings. And those people in the jury may come from a different culture where too much eye contact is bad. They may come from a culture where too much eye contact means something. They may also have trigger points that when you look at them with an angry face, it makes them feel something. If I were coaching her, I would say, hey, that's a little bit over the top right there. When you look over there and you start making all those mean faces, what if that person over there has had an experience that you're triggering? And I'll give you, before we end this, one of my favorite ever stories I've heard about body language from an attorney when they learned that I was doing this. So she needs to be more cautious with that hard eye contact. Now, you guys remember there used to be a like a litter, a cat litter commercial on TV for, a, I think it was Tidy Cats, called Stank Face. You remember that? When the people would walk in the room and their face would go, well, she's doing some of that, which is a little bit over the top. And it would be funny if it were not for the fact that that happens when her feelings are hurt more than when it's about her being threatened. Her words trail. She kind of runs way back. She'll number hundreds regularly, if not daily, hundreds with no emotion. I receive hundreds of death threats regularly, if not daily. But when she starts talking about mocking is when she gets that little stank face thing going on and her whole emotional demeanor changes. She rubs her legs and there's too much emotion in the wrong places for me. Chase, what do you got? Yep, I agree with you. And right at that question, what threats have you endured? The attorney asked her this question, then it's business-like, emotional. There's this large inhale, turns to the jury and instantaneously starts with this face wrenching again, like you talked about stank face, uh, to get into an emotional state. And this rapid shifting of facial expressions is not truthful. If this is peer reviewed, this is well reviewed in, in multiple studies. And it's, it's very strange. We don't see this very often, <clears throat> but she says mocking three times. And my testimony about being uh, assaulted and not mocking her abuse, not mocking her suffering, not mocking her life, but they're mocking the testimony, not the fact that she was abused. They're, they're mocking the testimony, which is an interesting point to make here. Not, I'm not saying there's some deception here, but that's a definite huge red flag. There's a disgust facial expression uh, in her trial baseline in general. She makes this kind of disgust uh, facial expression. And if you imagine smelling sticking your nose into a rotten gallon of milk and sticking your nose down there. It makes everything in your face kind of go towards the middle. And that's what we're, we're seeing here. But 
Throughout this whole thing, she's selling and not telling. She's checking the responsiveness of the jurors. One, two, three, just kind of scanning around uh, the jury pool. What to be a deeply internal experience of discussing her suffering. She, she's checking to make sure that she's touching base with each person when she should be emotional. And emotions don't happen when she's processing the questions. They happen when she's looking at the jury. This is a big deal. And when she says, I want Johnny to leave me alone, this was the entire case against her, is him trying to get her to do the exact same thing. So it's strange. But I want you to watch one point during this that's really special to me. When Camille, which is uh, Depp's attorney, objects, the facial expression to the jury disappears and she's back to holding it off just to look at Camille just to look at that one person who's objecting. So the instant, all of the suffering just vanishes and she gets cold and calculating just to look back at Camille. Pretty strange. Scott, what do you think? All can, right. Can I have one okay. thing first? Guys, this is our opinion and we want you to remember that as you go through this video. All of it. Yep. Oh yeah. And remember, we know people go through stuff much worse than this. We understand that. We, we, we really get it. We know people go through some horrendous things that we'll never hear about and that you'll never hear about. So we, we take that into consideration. We're talking about this one person and our opinions. And that's all it is of this one person's behavior that we're seeing. All right. And Johnny Depp, I guess two different people. So, um, all right. So after uh, Camille says the, the the threats that you you describe, her eyes are wide. They're wide open, and the only blinking we see is when we see that that eye flutter, that eyelash fl or eyelid flutter, um, right after that. And then there's another pause where her eyes are locked in on her, and then she just keeps looking at her. And after that, the lawyer says a non-responsive. We see 18 expressions of contempt, disgust, anger, scorn, sadness. All these and a lot and. Altogether, there are 26, but 18 of those are micro expressions, which which go on from a micro expression to a big uh, expression. Again, like Chase was saying, these things don't morph from one to the other. They just click like she's clicking a dial to show these different expressions. That's not real. That's not right. That's acting. I'll say it, it's not acting very well. How does that sound? So then at the same time, we're not seeing any tears. All this time, she's supposed to be so upset and all this stuff is happening and her voice doesn't crack. When you're that upset, when you're talking about things like that, and you're upset, your your vocal cords, your your larynx will start, or the muscles around it will start contracting. There's none of that. Her voice is almost smooth as she's going through this. It doesn't crack. It's clean. It's clear. You can hear everything. That's just really unusual for situations like this. Then when she says, uh, uh, you can continue, it's, again, odd placements of these expressions. They'll start before she, before they're supposed to, and the... the She'll, as she's talking, they'll just fly in there and fly out, and they're odd. They're not timed correctly. That's that's an odd way to say that, but that's the only way I know how to know how to put it. But watch for those twenty six different expressions in there. How they click from one to the other. Just one, two, three, four, five, and you can count them as you go through. You might see the micro expressions if you look really tight, but um, you'll definitely see the bigger expressions that they morph and they don't morph into, but they click into. And then before she says, "I just want Johnny to leave me alone," she goes, "Oh." Oh, like this. And the reason it looks so weird and it gives you such an irky feeling is because she can't pull off those emotions she's supposed to have that she's trying to sell. Oh. I just want Johnny to leave me alone. She's trying to work herself up and fire herself up to go into this deep emotion thing when she says, I just wanted to leave Johnny to leave me alone. It just it doesn't work because it's so fake. And it look, that's why you get that feeling. Everybody watching this play went, oh, that's horrible because it's fake and she can't get up enough emotion to, to pull that off. So I'll, I'll leave it there because I know Mark's got a whole bunch of stuff. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I agree. Quick successions of disgust, disdain, distaste uh, in the mouth there. I think you're right, Scott. Some of it is absolutely to do with her trying to kind of raffle through emotions, not being able to pick the right one, clearly doing that for the jury. I think some of it is is there's some good literature out there that says we will get an abundance of those uh, those emotions around certain personality disorders. And so there's there's a good chance that there's a baseline there of of this um, disgust and distaste and disdain, which is around a personality disorder. But you know, regardless of all of that, 
is it having an effect on the jury? Wh which way are they going to go? Because, you know, it's probably quite right to try and have an effect on the jury because they're the ones that are going to make the decision. Well, we're not there. We can't see the effect on them. But we can experience some of the effect that it's having on the judge. Or certainly I was having a conversation with an old friend of mine who happens to be a judge, happens to be a magistrate in the UK system. However, she is a magistrate that deals with a great deal of domestic violence cases. And in this conversation, very trusted person, in this conversation, she said, well, if the judge believed these emotions, if the judge believed that Amber Heard is experiencing some very difficult emotions at this time, the judge has a duty of care. And the judge would probably, possibly, maybe say something like, Miss Heard, do you need a moment? Or let's take a break for a moment. If she believed what was going on here. I suspect, I don't think, I've not seen that the judge at any point during Heard's most emotional displays has ever done that. I'm going to take from that that the judge doesn't buy this. Well, it doesn't really matter because the judge isn't making a decision, okay? The judge is just running the court and going, I will decide if somebody needs time because the judge, it's the, the idea is, is the judge will get, will help the, the victim get out the straight facts uh, unencumbered in many cases by the emotion because it maybe doesn't help. Often it doesn't help get the story across correctly. In this case, the judge seems to be letting her run with this. Well, I think that's interesting. I think that's interesting because if that's the case, the judge doesn't buy it. If the judge doesn't buy it, why would the jury buy it? So it's maybe not having the effect that she'd like it to have. Uh, now, having said that, US system could be de very different from my friend's UK system. I don't, I don't know. Amber, other than the threats that you've described, what other threats have you endured since the Deb Waldman statements were made? I receive hundreds of death threats regularly, if not daily. Thousands since this trial has started people mocking mocking my testimony about being assaulted, making fun of my... Objection relevance, non-responsive. What's the damage? You can continue. It's been agonizing, agonizing, painful, and the most humiliating thing I've ever had to go through. I hope no one ever has to go through something like this. Oh. I just want Johnny to leave me alone. I just want him to leave me alone. I've said that for years now, and I thought he would after 2020. Question non-responsive. What do you hope to reclaim after this is over? Protecting the secret that I did for as long as I did has taken enough of my voice. Johnny, Johnny has taken enough of my voice. I have the right to tell my story. I have the right to say what happened to me. I have the right to my voice and my name. He took it long enough. I have a right as an American to talk about what happened to me, to own my story and my truth. I have that right. I hope to get my voice back. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Right at this whole secret thing. We're talking about this secret. There's distancing because there's no mention of anything there. There's no abuse. There's no getting beat. There's no mention of anything. It's all encapsulated in this one word secret where we see an eye flutter and we see facial avoidance right at that exact moment when she's talking about this secret. What she's saying, there's a right to tell my story, to say what happened, my voice. 
there's a huge sad expression as she's scanning the jury. Her face goes way down. You can see it here, almost forced. And when she's saying, I have a right to talk about what happened to me and own my story and, and truth, she's still checking the jury one at a time uh, for signals that she's being effective, I think. And the only time truth is mentioned here is when it's her truth, not the truth, her truth. And I think there's a difference between those two. And this missing voice routine kind of sounds like it's from a movie. Not sure which one. Maybe you know. If you do, let me know in the comments. I'll just search for the word movie and uh, see if you get it. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. Um, so let's look at, again, the context of this and, and the images and maybe the linguistics that are going on. As some of you might know, I've spent quite a bit of time as what back in the UK we call a spin doctor, somebody who takes a story and politically makes it into something else. Here's there's some great spin going on here. I mean, all credit to anybody who's trying to get their way on something. They're trying to convince not only a jury, you know, uh, 10, 12, whatever it is, people, I think eight go in at the end or maybe six, can't quite remember, but a, a mass of people, but also a public out there. The question that's put is about reclaiming. Well, that's really interesting because it says that you had something in the first place and it was taken away. So the reclaim, the taking back of what was yours, and it then redirects to human rights. Well, that is always a great thing to put down because, because it's very difficult for people to go, well, no, I mean, you shouldn't have any human rights. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's very good for those to be taken away from you. So the moment you go to human rights, then you're now on a super moral high ground on that. So she's, she spun it to her human rights have been taken away. That's a tough one. I mean, you can say, well, no, I don't think that's the case because you were able to talk um, and nobody stopped you talking. They just sued you around it. I mean, just look, you can say whatever you like yeah, in, in America, for sure. Say whatever the hell you like uh, just about anywhere. I think there's only, you know, you can't shout fire in a theater probably like you can't in the, in the UK. But apart from that, you can say whatever you like, but there are consequences. If you say stuff, somebody will sue you um, or, or some other consequences. You know, some in some cases you can say stuff and you will go to jail. You're not allowed. I mean, you can say it, but you're not protected but in, in what you say. Um, you're protected to say it. You're not protected after the fact. So she deflects to redirects to the to, to the human rights. And then she deflects to an even higher power, probably, which is an American. And that for me is great spin because we would say all the time, look, let's just get out there, stick the flag up the flagpole, you know, and just let's attach our message to the flag because it's so hard for somebody to take that message down unless you're, they're your enemy and then, you know, they'll burn the flag. But if, if it's your group, they will not attack that. So what I love about that piece of spin there is she went for the two, she spun it to the two of the, of the highest. She didn't quite hit God there. Uh, that would be the, the next place to go. Not going for that one. Um, maybe because of her, her audience in, in, in general, who she's trying to align with there. But give her a Jew, good spin. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Where you going? Yeah, Mark, I'm almost going to mirror exactly what you said. I mean, I call it the duty, her duty on her country speech. I mean, mm -hmm. she's wrapping herself in the flag. She's talking about human rights. She's doing all of that. And, and I just said, boy, this one ain't choreographed, is it? It's, I'm an American. I need my voice, my truth, modern words, really strong modern words. Um, I, I said she should have thrown in some other rights while she's swinging for the fence. What the hell? You know, just go for it. But there she was. This is the audition of her lifetime, guys. This whole trial, if she has been successful to now, this is her last audition. If she fails this and she comes out as a monster who's saying he's a monster and she's wrong, you think she's going to work again? Do you think people are going to line up to see the movie? This could be a big deal for her. So in my opinion, she has to deliver on whatever she's trying to here. Do I think she does? No. She does start with some good sorrow. Her brow tips are pointing up. And you can see it. She, but then she starts to kind of go down that well toward anger. Let me tell you one thing. People who are angry, 
show it like that. They don't ramp slowly up to it and stumble over it. It comes up very quickly. I'll, I'll, based on my, it's been many years since I studied all the impact of, of adrenaline on the system. But if I, my memory serves me correctly, in about 45 microseconds, you start to show thumbs rotate in, your rib, your rib cage gets rigid. Lots of things start to happen. It doesn't slowly build up as your words get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what we're seeing here. That's acting. That's going down the well. That's trying to build up enough emotion to feel it. And then the last one is, Chase, you've said it over and over and over. Only children have that flush of emotions run across their face like this. Little bitty children may have it. I've seen little bitty children when they're confused and they're trying to control an emotion because they know it's going to go badly for them. And you'll see them, it break through and go back, break through and go back. But it's not many emotions. It's one and a control, one and a control, one and a control. That's not what I see here. On his part, if you watch Jep, or Depp, I see him milling his jaw, and doing everything possible to avoid eye contact with her. When she looks down, he looks away, all of those kinds of things. So this is her last audition, in my opinion. That's what I think we're seeing. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, that's pretty good. So you guys have covered pretty much everything. But after the question, when she's first asked the question, a lot of people are going to say, oh, I see a single shoulder shrug. She's actually down here rubbing her hands doing that. So after the question, you'll see that come up. You may think that. You may not have seen that or, or might be thinking about it. That's That's what I... Um, saw in that part and she's using that her hands as an adapter because it's getting pretty stressful for her at this point she knows that question is coming and she's obviously she's prepped for it so she's ready for it and it's pretty much like you guys were saying the same stuff we saw earlier she's pre pre you know delivering a prepared answer and the emotions are are fake and she's just trying to be dramatic what do you hope to reclaim after this is over Protecting the secret that I did for as long as I did has taken enough of my voice. Johnny, Johnny has taken enough of my voice. I have the right to tell my story. I have the right to say what happened to me. I have the right to my voice and my name. He took it long enough. I have a right as an American to talk about what happened to me, to own my story and my truth. I have that right. I hope to get my voice back. Ms. Hurd, you just testified that this case has been very hard for you. So let's talk about that and why. All right. Your lies have been exposed to the world multiple times, right? I haven't lied about anything I've been here to say. You sat here and told this jury that the events in Hicksville started with Mr. Depp getting really upset about a woman leaning on you. Is that correct? Yes, that's effectively what happened, yeah. You testified that he actually grabbed that woman's wrist and twisted it, right? And told her that he could effectively break her wrist by saying he knew how many pounds of pressure, or asking her how many pounds of pressure it took to break a human wrist. But your own witness, your former best friend, Rocky Pennington, she didn't corroborate that, did she? Uh, I'm not quite sure what part of that night she saw. There were a lot of people there. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, just one little thing here, body language right wise that I really like, uh, micro expressions of disgust and disdain around former best friend Rocky Pennington. Now, is that uh, disgust and disdain because it's a former best friend who didn't uh, tell a story that uh, Heard would have liked to have heard to have told? I don't know. Is it disgust and disdain for the 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 question? being asked or discussed and disdain for something else around that. And by the way, as I've said before, there is just this baseline of disgust and disdain with, with Heard. But in this particular case, it is framed by nothing else happening in the face. And they're, they're pretty good micro expressions that are happening there. So I'm going to say it's a real feeling, not acted, of disgust and disdain around that issue there. Um, I don't know whether it's about the question or whether it's about a former best friend, but might be worth you just going back, taking a look in there, you know, going frame by frame and taking a look yourself and seeing what that looks like. Scott, what do you got on this one? 
All right. We see eyelid flutter when she says, uh, your, your lies have been exposed to the world multiple times. That sort of, sort of hits her wrong at that point because she knows this is important. And her voice, her voice tone is much lower here. Her, her, the volume of her voice is lower. Her cadence is a lot slower. She's just, just delivering this ding, ding, just one, two, three, like that. Her posture is bent forward a little bit. And all these cues are letting us know that she's a little bit, she's unsure about answering this and that's going to come out right. She's not really, maybe she didn't rehearse it enough or wasn't ready for it, but that's what it looks like to me anyway. And then she does an eye roll when she's, when she's asking her about how many pounds of pressure, when she says, when she asks her the question, she says, he's talking about how many pounds of pressure on the thing. We see an eye roll in there. That's a cue of disrespect. And see, so you could say it's boredom. That's a lot of times you'll see that uh, when so with someone who's bored. But in this case, I think it's, 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 disrespect and you know get the credit try to make his credibility look low but i think he says stuff like that all the time you know that's why she would do the eye roll i actually think that was real because maybe he sits around trying to say cool stuff he says some pretty cool stuff so maybe he's saying cool stuff all the time and she's just sort of over it you know amber and i do that when i tell the same joke over and over and with a different group of people she's so over all my jokes so it, you know i'm sure i get a lot of eye rolls in there from her that's the feel i can feel it coming off her at this point i think I, I thought she really didn't like him at all at this point. I thought she she doesn't like him, not, not in love with her anything. Now I think she hates his guts, especially after seeing the eye roll like that. I think she's so over this guy she can't stand it, which she should be at this point, I guess. Chase, what do you got? Right at this point where she's saying I haven't lied about anything I've come here to say, there's qualifying. There's no mention of truth whatsoever. There's a lack of a confident denial, and there's immediate mouth closure after her statement, which are all indicators of deception. And we treat if we're treating uh, body language and behavior profiling like meteorology, we're looking at science-based stuff, collecting a bunch, and then providing a likelihood of deception to you, just like precipitation. That was a high degree of a uh, high percentage of preci- precipitation. It's <laughs> a nice shot, man. Good <laughs> brain. And it just said snow. Would have been easier. <laughs> He's Canadian, of course, it's snow. <laughs> so uh, once she's saying there's a lot of people there, she shifts back. I want you to watch her face closely. She shifts back to her trial protection face when she was sitting with her attorney watching Depp take the stand. This this very protected face that she's adopted. And I'm surprised I haven't. I'm not an attorney. Maybe an attorney. If you are an attorney, let us know why. But I haven't heard maybe once. I don't know. I don't think I've heard it. An objection for assuming facts, not in evidence, which is. I've heard here many times, as far as I know, Greg, have you any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, the only thing I have noticed, Chase, before I get into my part, the, um, the only thing I have noticed is they will introduce into evidence things that were not there already, because we'll see that late in this series of videos. And it may just be that they're doing it and we clip the video in a place where there's something that that they had introduced and it was brand new. The good thing is when you introduce something Oops. brand new, we get to see stress. That's a great. <laughs> news. That's Look great. at me. Look at me. <laughs> you broke oh up. my God. <laughs> <laughs> what the? Oh my God. It's Rouse, not like the good camera happy either. to be on the behavior panel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, fellas. Um, I'm never going to hear the end of this. <laughs> never. So this is about as friendly as her face gets. Mark, I agree with you. She has all this negative emotion and all this disdain and all that just wrapped up in there. And this is actually pretty calm for her, but it's how she keeps her face set. She says, all right. And you can hear her being kind of placating and talking to the front of her mouth. That's a good indicator that, all right. Then you hear, if you pay attention to her, you'll see that two faces. When she's talking to her attorney, she's got a much calmer face than she does here. And that shows you all that disdain and everything else is in there. A couple of things that are interesting for me that they should have chased is when she says, I haven't lied about anything I have been here to say. Hmm. Question number two. Well, what about the things we forced you to answer would have been my question. I would have cr- crawled her. And we're going to see more of that. She's conditioning the question, and she has a long, drawn-out pause to answer the question as she's talking about the woman leaning. She does that little bobblehead thing. And while that may be part of many cultures, it's not in ours. So something's going on in her head there. And I'll, I'll leave a couple of last ones. I got a bunch here. But 
you'll watch her as she's trying to answer the question, rifle up left, rifle up right, as she's trying to figure out how to respond to, is that he was leaning, she was leaning on you and he got angry. And she said, you could effectively say that. And Chase, when she does that quick mouth close, she does a lip retraction at the same time. There's no emotion whatsoever when she's talking about him threatening this person. The only thing we see is she sways when she disqualifies her friend Rocky, in addition to Mark, all that disdain that comes up. So I think there's something here. There's something that we would dig into. One question that she avoided that they let her get away with. That's it. And now we'll go and try to find Scott. Yeah, John. Can you guys still hear me? you just testified that this case has been very hard for you. So let's talk about that and why. All right. Your lies have been exposed to the world multiple times, right? I haven't lied about anything I've been here to say. You sat here and told this jury that the events in Hicksville started with Mr. Depp getting really upset about a woman leaning on you. Is that correct? Yes, that's effectively what happened, yeah. You testified that he actually grabbed that woman's wrist and twisted it, right? And told her that he could effectively break her wrist by saying he knew how many pounds of pressure, or asking her how many pounds of pressure it took to break a human wrist. But your own witness, your former best friend, Rocky Pennington, she didn't corroborate that, did she? Uh, I'm not quite sure what part of that night she saw. There were a lot of people there. But you testified that you had absolutely nothing to do with the video's release, right? Absolutely not. And you testified that you learned about it when you landed after flying into LA. Do you remember I, that testimony? Upon touchdown is when I was alerted to the video's you existence You heard online. Mr. Tremaine testify that this about this video as well yesterday, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you heard Mr. Tremaine testify that TMZ received the cabinet video the same day you landed at LAX, yes? I don't know if that I, I don't know if that's what his testimony was. I'm sorry. You heard Mr. Tremaine testify that the cabinet video was posted 15 minutes after TMZ received it. Yes. That's what I heard him say. And that this could only have been possible if the video was received directly from the source. Yes. I heard him say that. I don't know if that's true or if that's possible because it didn't come from me. I Mr. was flying. Tremaine. So that, I know that's incorrect. Is what I mean to say. All right, Chase, what do you got? So right at the absolutely not point, there's an immediate mouth closure there. I was I was alerted to the video's existence online. And Camille's question was about learning about it being posted. And if someone else leaked the video for her, these are the words that you might expect to hear in a scenario like that. And when she's saying it came directly from the source, I'm just going to touch on a couple things here. Uh, she's saying, I don't know if that's uh, true or if that's possible. It's She's talking about her own phone. And let's talk about qualifiers really quick. If I ask uh, Greg, uh, did you do drugs last night? And Greg's answer is, well, not to the best of my knowledge. That's potentially deceptive. But I, if I ask Greg, did the guy who lives four doors down from you do drugs last night? And you say, well, not to the best of my knowledge. It's the same answer, but whether or not it's deceptive or potentially deceptive is based on what question was being asked. And this question is very specifically about her phone, which makes a huge difference. So it depends on the situation being asked about, but in this situation, yes, there is a high, a very high likelihood of deception where she said, I don't know how that could happen or if that's possible. It was her own phone. So she's not making a denial about something she very well should be if she was being truthful. And when she's saying it, it didn't come from me, I was flying. As an interrogator, here is where you dig. She asked somebody to send it. I I would be willing to say as an interrogator in that moment, I'm, I, my only thought would be I need to find out who sent it because it wasn't her. It was probably somebody that was asked to send the video. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, thanks for picking me next, because I'm going to fall right in where you dropped off. The interrogator in me would be crawling all over her at the moment. Let's just do a couple of things. Number one, I'm going to cover two pieces of body language. That's it. The rest, we're going to unpack her deception or her potential deception. 
Number one, she started off by saying absolutely not and did a lip compression, minor but a lip compression. If you pay really close attention, she's either holding back emotion or information or something. I always call, you know, real hard grip. Usually there's emotion, but it's always some kind of information. The other thing she does is she whips her head around. Having that little tail hanging there, you notice her head whipping around. And anybody who has ever had any involvement with, I, I won't say all women do it, but every woman I've ever met, when you anger them, their heads move differently than they do when they're talking like, happily. So that's a bad indicator that she's starting to get aggressive back. Now let's interrogate what she said. She said she conditioned a question and she negotiated the answer by saying upon touchdown was when I was alerted of the video's existence online. There's a hell of a lot of distancing, conditioning, qualifying, everything you can think of in there. So I'm just going to run down a list of things I might ask her, which video. I want to make sure I lock her down to which video we're both talking about. And my next question would be, were you surprised? Because that's a real potential for her to lie. And guys, when we talk about indicators of deception, we're talking about a social contract that humans have with each other that we feel guilt, remorse, or discomfort with breaking. So every time you give a person, when you're questioning them, the opportunity to break that contract, the interrogator gets to go, well, there's a deviation in word, in deed, in breath, breathing rate, in physical things, in body language, all of that. So then I would say, is it the first time that you learned about this video? Guess what? That's a leading question. And by interrogator speak, that means it only has a yes or no answer. And that is usually considered a bad question. But I would be doing it to corral her so that when she says it's from her phone, she can't say it's first time she'd learned about the video. So I've now redirected the conversation to, into my wheelhouse. Then I would say, where did this video originate? How did it give me your phone to the distributor? Whoever distributed it, don't care. What was the agreement with the distributor? All those are building pressure and we get the chance to see things. Were you surprised by its appearance? Were you surprised by the video's appearance online? Now let me reframe the question, Ms. Heard. How did a video from your phone appear on the internet without your knowledge? And that changes the equation from what she just answered. Now she's got to lie seven times to get to that final lie and it's building up on her. Now, when she locks her down about this TMX testimony, her use of language starts to fade. And we know that fight or flight turns off the thinking brain and turns on the cat or responsive brain. And when that happens, then she starts to go humana, 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 words that make no sense. She didn't come with it as a prepared answer. And I would ask her the last question, how did that get from your possession to there? How did it get there? That's my one question. It, by letting her get away with this, she's come with one sentence she has to stumble through and prepare, and you didn't take it apart. You didn't unpack it. We all know that that's part of being an attorney and part of being in front of people, but that's the power of questions. That's interrogator brain. Scott, what do you got? All right. Two things for me. I'll, I'll keep mine fairly short. There's that word, absolutely. Not that it means that somebody's, every time you hear it, somebody's being deceptive, but boy, you sure hear it a lot when somebody's being deceptive. I mean, we hear it all the time. Absolutely not. You know, that's, I don't know, every time I hear that. Another thing that makes me pay attention when, was when people start talking weird. You know, she says, uh, upon touchdown. Who talks like that? Uh, astronauts, maybe. It'd be like me saying to Greg. Tussle. Uh, yeah, yeah, a tussle. Upon touchdown, I shall meet you in the uh, what Sky Lounge at the Delta, and we'll have those little uh, chicken sandwich croissants like we love so much, and we shall drink the sparkly fizzy water like as doth the rich man. And we, nobody talks that way. So every time I hear something like that, I go, every, there's just everything in me goes, wait a minute, hang on, man. Say that again. Talk again. So I make him talk about it again, or I would make them talk about it again. That, so that just bugs me. That just sends off every red flag. And I agree with you, Greg. I'd climb right up there and, and just tear that whole story apart at that point. Mark, what do you got? That, that's how I talk all the time when I'm inviting people to the lounge, by the way. Just just drink the fizzy water as doth the rich man. That's, a, that's, no, that's just normal English, by the way, just so everybody knows. Um, so, uh, look, she's decided to wear her hair today or have it managed for her in a less puritanical way. So it's it's falling in tresses. And just as Greg, you were saying, it means we can really pick up the movement. And some of the movement, like you say, is just, it's just 
exaggerating some of the normal head moves and some of the movement is exaggerating some of the more extreme head moves. And there are some times, I think, where we really see a clear flick of that hair. Now, that I would say is, is, a, is a faint move, not a faint as in like I'm fainting, but a distraction move and, and a kind of a showing off move. She's got good hair, that's expensive hair that she's got there. And one of the things that males and females, but probably culturally across the planet, more predominantly females will use their hair as a display of status. Uh, I thought you'd like that one, Chase, a display of status, and then flick that hair, move that hair around. So as many people as possible can see that the, the wealth that went into that hair. Yeah, Greg, nothing I can do for you, mate. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing I can do for you. You're an outlier at a whole different, a whole different level. Um, so I would say she is where we see those head, those hair flicks. She is very aggressive against the question. She thinks she is bigger, higher status, or she wants to show higher status against the question. Now, I think there's a slip up here. I could be wrong. I often get these kind of things wrong, but I think there's a slip up here. It did not come from me. I was lying. She said, well, hang on. Did she just admit she was lying? Did not come from me. I was lying. What do you think, Greg? You say, I think she said flying. I think it's just the way oh, I was assume. flying. <laughs> <laughs> that's I think that's right. what she said. That's yeah. why you have. Yeah. See, I don't speak American, only English. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's scrub that completely. Then did not come from me. Uh, I was flying. That's incorrect is what I meant to say. So she does still correct herself on that. That did not come from me, I was flying. Mm, could have still come from her. And then she corrects that to, I was incorrect is what I meant. It was incorrect is what I meant to say. All right, that's all I got on that one. But you testified that you had absolutely nothing to do with the video's release, right? Absolutely not. And you testified that you learned about it when you landed after flying into LA. Do you remember that testimony? Upon touchdown is when I was alerted to the video's you existence You heard Mr. Online. Tremaine testify that this about this video as well yesterday, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you heard Mr. Tremaine testify that TMZ received the cabinet video the same day you landed at LAX. Yes? I don't know if that I, I don't know if that's what his testimony was. I'm sorry. You heard Mr. Tremaine testify that the cabinet video was posted 15 minutes after TMZ received it. Yes? That's what I heard him say. And that this could only have been possible if the video was received directly from the source. Yes? I heard him say that. I don't know if that's true or if that's possible. Because it didn't come from me. I Mr. was flying. Tremaine so it, it, I know that's incorrect is what I mean to say. This is you at the courthouse on May 27th, 2016, when you got your domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, right? It is. And next, and next to you, to you is, a is a woman named, named Jody Gottlieb, Gottlieb, right? Right. Yes, yes. Jody Gottlieb is your publicist. And dear friend. Yeah. Now I'd like to show you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1316. This is a picture of you and your friend Rocky Pennington, right? That is correct. Your Honor, I'd like to move to admit this photograph. Any objection to 1316? No, Your Honor. All right, 1316 in evidence. You can publish the jury. This is a, this picture, is a picture of of you on May 28th, 2016, right, Ms. Hurd? I don't know when this was taken. This is the day after you obtained the domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, right? I have no idea when this um, image was taken. I did not take it. There's no bruise on your face in this picture, is there? Again, I don't know when this was taken. And also, I'm outside. I was obviously wearing makeup. I have no idea when this was taken, so I have no idea if I can Let's speak to what recollection. bruise you can Let's see Let's refresh your recollection about when this picture was taken. Um, can we please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1315, just for the witness? This is an article dated May 30th, 2016, right, Ms. Hurd? That's what it says, yes. And this article contains the same photograph of you and Ms. Pennington we were just looking at, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, I see that. And the article is entitled, Amber Heard Smiles as She Puts Arm Around Friend One Day After Getting Restraining Order Against Johnny Depp. Is that, is that what the title says? I know that's what the title says, yes. Your Honor, I'm going to move to admit and publish the article with everything but the headline and date and the photo redacted. 
All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm short on this one. When we first started the show, you guys remember when we were trying to say, what do we like best about body language? Like 150 episodes ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. Mine was that. amusement. And amusement has always been, for me, a beautiful thing to watch because people's cheeks will rise, but they'll contain their smile and their eyes will still engage the smile and you can't miss it. And you're starting to see some of that in with her here. She's prepared for this question. She looks at the jury with a smug face. And so she's just ready for it. You see her neck stiffen and tighten just a little bit. And she goes, I did not take the picture. That's she sits up straight. It's just all rigid. She's prepared. It's just conflict for her. Now, Depp, if you watch him, here's a really good example of what we always talk about. When somebody recognizes something, their brow rises, his attorney leans over and says something to him and his brow goes, Choop. Interesting. So something he recognizes something or he's recognizing the idea and it taking it in. And then there's also that odd nervous smile that's part of his persona as he, and watch him tapping and, and drilling his fingers. That tells you when he's on the stand, he's contained and under control later. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, in the first half, she's calm and her body language is pretty much the same as it's been from what we've seen before. And then when she the, sees the picture of, her, of seeing her friend, she kind of, it, it's almost like, hits her a little bit. So that's, uh, that shows she's interested in it, but she knows it's coming at that point. She's acting like, ah, oh, it's kind of like a little, little surprise. And she smiles a little bit. Um, and when she says, I have no idea, uh, when that picture was taken, I did not take it. She didn't contract. You would say, normally you would say, I don't know when that picture was taken up, you know, I didn't take it, but she doesn't. So we, that, that's a cue. Most likely this was, you know, something they rehearsed and were ready for and, and playing for. So, but, but when they don't, contract that's when that's another one of those things when somebody starts talking that makes me perk up and start paying attention like a big red flag um all right so i got chase what do you got yeah i just want to know who brings a publicist to the court for photo oh wait she's a dear friend that that makes it well sorry i forgot about that uh right when camille's saying there's no bruise on your face is there these I think uh, the is there stuff and didn't you and aren't you could have been rephrased to be a little softer uh, to help that that legal team, because the legal team and whether or not the jury likes the legal team, sadly, is just about as important as whether or not they like the defendant and the plaintiff. But she denies knowing the date of the photo. About and the questions about a bruise, she denies the date. And a truthful witness would, in in my opinion, be more okay with talking about wanting to cover up the bruise, the desire to cover it up, and recalling the date after having spent weeks reviewing all of her evidence. I think a truthful person would have experienced some shame about the bruise, especially if it's a if it's what a witness is referring to as the huge secret that would openly discuss the desire to conceal the bruise instead of publicize them. I don't know when this was taken, so I can't say whether or not you can see a bruise in this photo or not. So we see this just like legal language here. But whoa, this took me for a ride this morning. How bizarre and out of character from what we've all likely seen in truthful recollection of witnesses when she says, I don't know when this was taken, so I can't say whether you see a bruise. I don't know when it was taken, so I don't know whether there's a bruise in front of my face looking at this photo right in front of me. Super strange. And continuing to, to argue about these like uh, dates and stuff, instead of saying yes, she's trying to be a lawyer, which is a bad idea, especially on the last day when the jury is going to deliberate. And she's saying that's what it says. Yes, I see that. I know that's what the title says. Yes. You just agree, be more agreeable because the jury needs to like you. And I'll go off on a short rant here. It'll be about 40 seconds if you guys will allow it. I know it's uh, easy to see people on YouTube and think they're just some random dudes. All of us have well over, I think, probably 100,000 hours of interview and analysis experience. So when we see the comments like, well, did you think maybe she didn't have sleep or maybe they're stressed out? I think those are cute and helpful. I know you're trying to contribute. But here's one thing I want you to leave with you here. And the hardest thing to measure in academic studies is also the easiest for academic people to ignore. And that is skill. If somebody studies the science of athletics for their entire life, it will never make them an athlete. 
and somebody studies psychology for decades in college, it doesn't give them charisma or even social skills, even good people skills. And what studying academic sides of things does is increase knowledge. It doesn't necessarily increase skill. The real skills come when knowledge and skill are kind of paired together. And there's a huge, tremendous difference between an information expert and a skill expert with experience. And I'll leave you with one question here. As you hear all this stuff about body language on the internet, would you rather ride on the back of a motorcycle with somebody who's studied the physics of motorcycles for 20 years or somebody who's been riding them for 20 years? And that's all I have on that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. So, you know, often as well, it's where you place that skill and that knowledge and in places where maybe other people would never think to place it. I want you to have a look at one of those pictures, not the picture with her and her dear friend, the publicist, but the picture of her with her former friend, uh, Rocky Pennington, uh, former best friend, uh, Rocky Pennington. And um, OK, so what I want you to look at, by the way, listen, whenever you look at a still image, as we're always asked to look at this still image, look at this still image, we have to understand we're looking at a frame in time, okay? So we don't know what's happening before, and we don't know what's happening after, but there are some questions and ideas that may be helpful that come from where we are right now. I want you to go and look at how Amber Heard is holding the arm of Rocky Pennington. Rocky has a drink in her hand. I think it's this arm here. It's in really close. And Amber has her joint there. Okay. Now, just try and do this with a, with a best friend or former best friend. As they're walking along with a coffee, just tuck your arm around them and just grab their elbow joint and, and see what happens. See, see if they don't go, what the hell, what's, what's going on? See if they don't just shift a little bit to go, what are you, why are you controlling my arm and my... So look, here's the question that comes to mind, and I don't know the answer to this, but it's the kind of question that somebody skilled might think about, which is, is that hold from somebody who's caring, or is it from somebody who is being controlling? Are they comforting? and caring or are they controlling? Is that hold from somebody who's being friendly or are they being forceful? Now, again, I don't know the answer to that, but I know where my bias is swinging right now based on what I'm seeing and that I don't see that hold very much. Now, of course, you'll be able to come up with reasons and I can come up with reasons as well and we'll all be able to come up with reasons why that might happen in a moment after something or before something else but it is interesting that it's there. And if you missed that at all, what was happening there, well, that's what skill does for you, is to look in places that other people don't look. This is you at the courthouse on May 27th, 2016, when you got your domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, right? It is. And next, and next to you is a woman, woman named, named Jody Gottlieb, Gottlieb, right? Right? Yes. Yes. Jody Gottlieb is your publicist? And dear friend. Now I'd like to show you what's been marked as plaintiff's exhibit 1316. This is a picture of you and your friend Rocky Pennington, right? That is correct. Your Honor, I'd like to move to admit this photograph. Any objection to 1316? No, Your Honor. All right, 1316 in evidence. You can publish the jury. This is a this picture, is a picture of, of you on May 28th, 2016, right, Ms. Heard? I don't know when this was taken. This is the day after you obtained the domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, right? I have no idea when this um, image was taken. I did not take it. There's no bruise on your face in this picture, is there? Again, I don't know when this was taken. And also, I'm outside. I was obviously wearing makeup. I have no idea when this was taken, so I have no idea if I can Let's speak to what recollection. bruise you can Let's see Let's refresh your recollection about when this picture was taken. Um, can we please pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1315, just for the witness? This is an article dated May 30th, 2016, right, Ms. Heard? That's what it says, yes. And this article contains the same photograph of you and Ms. Pennington we were just looking at, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, I see that. 
And the article is entitled, Amber Heard Smiles as She Puts Arm Around Friend One Day After Getting Restraining Order Against Johnny Depp. Is that, is that what the title says? I know that's what the title says, yes. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to move to admit and publish the article with everything but the headline and date and the photo redacted. Ms. Vasquez has suggested that you faked bruises on your face. Is that true? Absolutely not. I didn't need to. Did you ever fake an injury caused by Mr. Depp? No. Is any of the evidence of your injuries that has been put to the jury in this trial fake? No, absolutely not. And to the extent that there may be some confusion over when a picture of spilled wine was taken, why might that be? Objection. Because there's so lack of foundation. Yeah, overruled. Because there's so many incidents of violence. There are so there's so many pictures. There's so much evidence. Most people don't have this kind of evidence for years, five years. And when I was saying that to Johnny on the phone in that recording, I was saying for years this has been going on. And I have pictures. We have texts. We have everything. Normally, you don't get this amount of evidence. That's what I was pointing out to Johnny. It would be crazy to try to challenge this in this way it's crazy it's easy to to not know the context of a, a picture of spilled wine because there are so many more important details pictures and also so much i didn't photograph so much i didn't have the presence objection of non-responsive all right greg what do you got yeah I'm, i'll be short on this one look when they ask her, she, did you ever fake an injury? She does a wonderful thing, and that is she shows exasperation. She holds her mouth open and she goes, but it's 12 seconds after she delivers the answer. This is a bad Kung Fu movie. This is something wrong here in the way she's delivering this. All that animation, all that messaging that she's doing is just not timely. So something's up. Then when she, they say something about photo evidence, that one shoulder rises and she's got that swivel switch going in when she looks at the jury she's making hard eye contact and making lots of faces she's got to be careful again depends on who's in the jury and which culture they may be from remember virginia is a real mix of cultures especially Greg, tell, us, tell us what that shoulder rise means really quick yeah thanks thanks for bringing that up yeah so uncertainty with what you're talking about or with what's being discussed when you do that single shoulder rise so we wonder okay why is this an issue for her for me, the biggest tell in this entire thing, when you want to talk about tells, though, is to have all of your messaging right and then suddenly deliver it like, you know, I really feel bad for you. I know you've been going through a lot, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what that looked like to me. It's that delayed or even more. It's seconds, if not many seconds later. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so here's the way I'm putting it, Greg, is there is a lot of emotional dressing around the whole piece. It's like a, yeah, I mean, it's like a costume of emotion being worn. And I really pick it up in the breathing. There's breathing that's happening around stuff that doesn't make any sense for the through line of what she's trying to achieve. It doesn't make any sense for the emotion that I think she's wanting to be having, or even any emotions that, that I know of. She's not breathing in a way that, that denotes any strong, clear emotion for me, which suggests it's dressing. And then the real nail on this one for me is, has any of the evidence of injury uh, been, been fake or words to that effect? There is a massively contrasting different tone to that answer. I mean, go back, look at it again and see what happens in pitch, in breathing, in that emotional breathing, dressing around it, and Scott, to your point earlier with that word, absolutely. And again, let's just say it again. It doesn't mean anything, but we hear it a lot. And we hear it a lot from people who've turned out to not be, not telling us the truth. Okay. It's not necessary. It's, 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 you know, it's absolutely not necessary to add that absolutely. Let's just say that. Anyway, I'll leave it, I'll leave it at, at, at that. And I'm sure everybody else is just going to compound on top of this. But let's see. Scott, what, what do you think? All right. I think this, uh, this answer was completely prepped because she's ready for it. And it's, it, she knows it's an important answer. That's an important question. So I think that's why they were ready for it. And when the other attorney breaks into it to object, she has to start all over again. She's man, she's like reared back, cocked and ready to go. But as soon as she goes, hey, 
and then she breaks in and goes okay and they make and starts the very same spot again so I, I think this is rehearsed and it's just and it's just it's, it sounds so pitiful to go it's just lame but you know what are you gonna say at this point we're seeing pretty much the same stuff over and over and over but it's just she's just a, she's not acting she's not delivering this as she should it doesn't look the, the way it should that's all i know what to say about it um chase what do you got yeah, I think uh, she believes this. I'm going to go out on a limb. But I think she believes this to an extent. And I think, this is my opinion, here is exactly how Amber believes her own story. So there are small pieces of events that she recalls that were truthful. Then she edits details and each one enough to just to increase the severity of a few things, according to her. And she's rehearsed the stories in her mind a lot, uh, many, many times. And I think also the final factor here is that she believes that she's doing something good for herself, but more importantly, that she is doing something good for humanity. And even if some of the details are changed, Johnny's still a bad person. So I can edit a few of these details and it's okay because he's still mad, bad and evil. So changing a few things doesn't change who he is in her mind. It helps the world understand how bad he is and it helps her to become an icon who can help women. So the imagined uh, morality here justifies the blending of fact and fiction. And I think that's what's really going on deep down. Uh, juries are only processing data during pauses. So I'll say this for every attorney and every person who's ever going to be deposed. Juries are only going to start processing the data once you stop talking, like you just did now. So the attorney just barrels through these questions and doesn't even look at her for her responses here. It's her own attorney not even looking at her for her emotional responses. Bad idea. When they're talking about the fake bruises on your face, nods yes before the answer. So it's mismatched and it deviates from ba her baseline behavior. And uh, did you ever fake an injury? She says no, and then shakes her head. Did you ever fake an injury caused by Mr. Depp? No. Is any of the evidence of your injuries? There's a spilled glass of wine photo discussion. Watch this clip a few times and rewind it. She starts answering with disgust facial expression on her face. And when the objection happens, right when the objection happens, this emotion on the face vanishes in less than a second while she coldly looks back over to Camille. And when it's overruled, instantly the, um, the sad emotions back on her face and she's looking back at the jury again. And to the extent that there may be some confusion over when a picture of spilled wine was taken. Why might that be? Objection. There's so lack of foundation. Overruled. What well, she's saying, there's so much evidence. I think this points to my opinion that she's viewing this mountain of evidence for Johnny being unusual, strange, mean, callous, leaving her, that she's able to emotionally justify the other actions or the other claims to assist her case. That's all she's doing is just assist as a small assistance in her mind. And I think, in my opinion, she views this evidence as being a mountain of abuse because she equates the two. I think that she equates the abandonment to abuse. So this mountain of evidence is real, 100% real in her mind. That's why she's talking openly and honestly about no one has this much evidence. No one ever has ever collected this much evidence in a case. So whether that's this is a thorough, deliberate falsification or a desire to be the center of attention, or she honestly just believes the story, which I doubt we may never know. Okay, well, nothing is I ever, got, yeah. nothing is ever, nothing is ever better than a <clears throat> person's. Scott, what do you got? Okay. I, you, here's your thing. When you get into it, man, you squish all up and do this number. You get this going. That's you know, when you would take me before we get started, that's, that's the one I'm going to get on you. That's fine. You just go, you squish down and get that yeah. hand going like that? Yeah. Okay. I got you. Keep going in and out of focus. Yeah, because right, you're, you're, right? you're moving your hands in front of the camera. You got I turned the autofocus off. I'm like, this camera's horrible. I bought it from Eric like a year and a half ago as my backup. Yeah. Bought a camera from Eric? <laughs> yeah. Is he a camera salesman now? Like what? Eric Hunley, that? camera salesman. <laughs> well, uh, camera's by Eric Hunley. Like, yeah, Scott, uh, do you want... <laughs> 
Ms. Vasquez has suggested that you faked bruises on your face. Is that true? Absolutely not. I didn't need to. Did you ever fake an injury caused by Mr. Depp? No. Is any of the evidence of your injuries that has been put to the jury in this trial fake? No, absolutely not. And to the extent that there may be some confusion over when a picture of spilled wine was taken, why might that be? Objection. Because there's lack so of foundation. Overruled. Because there's so many incidents of violence. There are so, there's so many pictures. There's so much evidence. Most people don't have this kind of evidence for years, five years years and when I was saying that to Johnny on the phone in that recording I was saying for years this has been going on and I have pictures we have texts we have everything normally you don't get this amount of evidence that's what I was pointing out to Johnny it would be crazy to try to challenge this in this way it's crazy it's easy to to not know the context of a, a picture of spilled wine because there are so many more important details pictures and also so much I didn't photograph, so much I didn't have the presence of Objection, non-responsive. How many times have you done MDMA in your life, Mr. Depp? Uh, actually, not many, not that many times, I would say in my lifetime, maybe in my lifetime, MDMA, six, seven, maybe. And how much... MDMA have you done on those occasions? Uh, not enough to, um, not enough to uh, properly, well, not, not, not enough to properly, properly experience the, what the um, chemicals are supposed to do to you. Have you ever consumed eight to 10 MDMA pills at once? No, ma'am. No, I have not. And why is that? Because um, I'd be dead. I'm pretty sure I'd be dead. Um. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, look, he does go around the houses a little bit to get to some answers here. And, <coughs> excuse me. Under normal circumstances, if somebody were taking that amount of time and going around the houses on this one, I might be a little bit worried. But given his baseline, this is fairly usual for him. And here's the important thing. He lands eventually on a very clear answer, like six or seven, and didn't have the effect it, it should, and I'd be dead. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, you could look at this and go, is he being deceitful here? Why is he taking such a journey? Why is he taking so long around this? That's normal for him. Lands on strong answers. I don't have a great deal of problem with his performance here. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I usually would agree with you, Mark. In this case, I'm not certain. Here's why. He conditions the hell out of the question. Yes, he's a he's a search for change in the floor as he speaks kind of guy. He doesn't do all that in here. When they ask him the question, he conditions the question. Actually, I would say not that many times. Then he negotiates even further by saying, in my lifetime, finally to an answer of six or seven maybe. He could have said four. He could have gone, uh, you know, uh, uh, but his baseline is exactly what you say. Hunting for the answer make hard eye contact, shake his head, or, or shake his head. His timing is not the same. Go back and watch the very first video we did. When he makes a point, he'll go, Mark, it was, uh, it was six, six or seven times. That's not here. Something's missing here. So I, I doubt it's six or seven times. My opinion is I would dig in a little harder, not that it matters for this case. All that they're trying to do is prove that he has used drugs, and then they're going to try to tie this into some other part. I, you know, I, I would bet you could find six or seven times that people have seen him use some drug. That, just my opinion. But So pay attention to that. Then he moves some to some distaste with his mouth that we didn't see earlier in these. And he, when they ask him about the eight to ten pills, he does something trademark for him, and that's that disarming smile he has. Hey, I'm Johnny Depp. <laughs> You know, self-deprecating, but a smile. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I tend to agree a little bit here. And uh, one, the first thing here is you're going to see, we talk about this contempt facial expression. What the hell does it look like? We talk about this a lot. Textbook, beautiful chef's kiss example, right on Amber Heard's face during the beginning of this. 
And you'll see the corner of the mouth go up. It's kind of a one-sided smile. This is a beautiful example on what it's supposed to look like, the textbook example of feeling contempt for another human being. But when he's saying and not enough to experience, you know, the, what the chemicals intend or something like that, the answers are looking a little more coached than normal. He's having trouble with the descriptive language. Uh, there's three postural retreats here just during this answer, three postural retreats where we lean away. There's facial touching, which is also in his baseline. So I ignore anything that's in baseline. But it sounds coached. It sounds a little rehearsed. It's likely not entirely truthful. I think the 8 or 10 thing is probably truthful. I looked it up. It's pretty bad. You'd probably be in the ICU uh, with that. But 8 to 10 MDMA at once, he, there's repetition of answer, which is more suggestive of honesty. And I think he's probably done enough to get the results in the past, uh, uh, despite what he claims here. That's all I got. Scott? All right. Uh, I think he's breaking eye contact to thank you. I'm just going to have to get rid of all the stuff you guys have already talked about. That's pretty normal. His cadence, is, it's a little bit wacky, but that goes with a persona he's chosen to, to show people the star. He's a star, baby. He's a star. So that's that's normal for that, that kind of thing. Um, he has no problem really talking about that he's done drugs. Everybody knows he's done drugs. We knew that before he went in doing this. Look who he was hanging out with. So, and the movies he's done, yeah, man, he's done drugs and we know it. So I don't think he has a problem talking about it, but I think the, the amount of times he's done MMDA, I think that might be a, 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 that might be a problem the number of times. I think she knows it's a lot more than he's going to say. That's why we see that contempt on her face. And I think this is a great example um, and something to save uh, and think about for what's coming up as the, I think the last video there, I go out of focus again. How many times have you done MDMA in your life, Mr. Depp? Uh, actually, not many, not that many times. I would say in my lifetime, maybe in my lifetime, MDMA, six, seven, maybe. And how much MDMA have you done on those occasions? Uh, not enough to, um, not enough to, uh, properly, well, not, not, not enough to properly, properly experience the, what the, um, chemicals are supposed to do to you. Have you ever consumed eight to 10 MDMA pills at once? No, ma'am. No, I have not. And why is that? Um... Because I'd be dead. I'm pretty sure I'd be dead. Um. Mr. Depp, when Dr. Kipper was treating your finger, what did you tell him about how your finger became injured? Um, I told him, I told him that there was obviously, I mean, when you saw the damage in the house and everything, the blood everywhere. I mean, obviously there was serious damage done. Um, I, there would be no point in lying to the man. He'd been through it with me and, and uh, Miss Herb before. I told him that she had uh, thrown a bottle, bottle of vodka and smashed my hair, smashed and cut my finger uh, off. The tip of my finger, just a, but a good chunk. I miss it. <laughs> Chase, what do you got? I was hoping you would call somebody else because I was chewing on an ice cube. <laughs> oh, I can. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so, listen, I think there's, again, some behaviors there that I would put within his baseline that I think, you know, other, if you didn't know that, you'd come into it and go, why is he taking so long? Why this? Why that? Here's what I do see him doing, which is smashed my, uh, smashed and cut my finger. So he's being very certain to maximize the, the injury there and not minimize it because we've had before in the case, um, testimony that says it was just, his finger was just smashed. He definitely wants people to know it was cut. Um, 
you know, even when I say it, smashed as opposed to cut. Cut is a much better word. It's a much more forceful word. You probably see a much better injury if I say cut finger rather than smashed finger, maybe. And I think that's what he's trying to go, trying to do. The smash alone just minimize it. He needs the cut. And then he says tip, the tip. And, and then he realized he's minimized that. So he has to go a considerable amount. So he doesn't want you to think that just the tip was smashed. He wants you to, to know that a considerable amount of the tip was cut. And again, once I tell you that story, much better, much better story. And then quite nicely, he finishes this piece of what I would say is spin. He's really trying to tell a good story about the injury there, which, which could could be true, could be could be false. I'll let everybody else weigh in as to how true or false that might be. But he, he finishes off with quite a good kind of Python-esque Jack Sparrow, I miss it at the end. Lovely little button at the end, I miss it. Uh, a bit of pathos there, which is part of his skill. He does often manage to button stories with a really nice, you know, pathetic line at the end. Quite skillful. Uh, Chase, what do you think? So in this video here, <clears throat> there's a shift to internal dialogue. And this happens when our eyes move down and to our left. And this is when we're talking to ourselves or rehearsing something that we've been reading or hearing uh, over and over again. And what he's saying, he'd been through it with me and misheard before. There's a shift to internal dialogue again. There's facial touching in his baseline, though. And there's hesitancy where he's pausing a little bit, a small amount more than usual. But this, I don't think the stress here is around the story, but his retelling of the story to the doc specifically. Not that the story wasn't accurate, but I think his stress is around the fact that whether or not he told the doctor the story. It looks like he's uncomfortable only during the recall of the relaying of the story to the doctor. And during the bottle story, of his testimony when he's talking about the bottle like whizzing past his head we've all seen that uh, that dramatic illustration there was no indicators of deception so now i'm only wondering if the doc was accurately informed or if he actually told the doc at all greg yeah i'm on the same page what's interesting here is when he is passionately talking about something and then here we know that his baseline is to look down into his left as he thinks about the answer he's going to use move his eyes over to the right as he searches for impact, then move around in his head. We know that when people's eyes move, it means something. Now, it, there's no absolutes. You have to go and dig for what it means. In his case, it's part of his baseline to go away left, away right, do that searching for change move that I was talking about, and then make eye contact and nod or shake his head. When he's emphatic, he does a very good job of that. When he's not emphatic, he does a poor job of the hard eye contact and shaking or nodding. What he does here is a poor job, which you might immediately say, well, he's talking about his finger being severed, but he isn't. This is not the emphatic. This is not the bottle wisdom by my head. This is not that. This is credibility of what I told the doctor. Well, the doctor is going to say whatever it is. So I don't feel, Mark, to your point, a lot of this is in baseline. He touches his face. So what? maybe his nose itches just is who he is. His, there are a couple of things that he does that are odd. He grabs the mic stand and moves it around. And I think, Chase, to your point, is because he feels uncomfortable with how to answer this. Don't know. I can't read his mind. I can only tell you that that's unusual for a guy who lives in front of a microphone. He stammers and his head shakes and he does what he usually would do, just not as hard to eye contact. That's the the biggest deviation I see. There's a narrowing of his mouth and his blink rate is up as he's looking for things. But it looks like he's relaying some information with some trepidation about what exactly to say and how to say it. Mark, I think if... He, in fact, realizes he's minimizing. That would be enough reason to cause him not to feel emphatic and to realize that he just stepped on his own feet and does something. We'll get a chance to see what he looks like when he's under stress. But that's it for this one. Scott, what do you got? All right. Again, he's acting like a star, which is what you expect from somebody like this. You want to see him do that. You want to see him be that way or you expect him to be that way. I'm not seeing any deception cues here. Not not much at all as it goes through here. But I do see somebody being really, really careful of what they're saying, as we all would be. So he's got to be very careful as he goes along here, making sure he doesn't say anything out of line uh, of what he's rehearsed 
uh, or what he's been told to talk about. I think that, that little uh, thing on his nose, that's a, when he's scratching his nose, that's just an adapter. And he keeps his arms really close to his body. And this helps him to look a little weaker, like he's not a big He-Man or very strong or anything. He keeps him really, really tight and really, really, really close. And I think that helps him uh, get maybe a little pity from the from the jury. It may help. It may, it may not. I don't know. And he's not pandering to the jury like she was. He's answering the questions to the attorney. He's not looking at the jury when, when the attorney asks him the questions. He doesn't flip around, look at the jury and answer and then come back to the, to the attorney. So you guys covered most everything here. And that's all I got. Could you repeat that? And you've also said that with Could you respect, repeat that, please? Yeah, yeah, that if you want to be with a woman, that she is rightfully yours. That's ludicrous. You've also said that with respect to women that you want to be with, you've remarked, I need, I want, I take, haven't you? Equally as ludicrous, no. Can you pull up DX883, please? You can pull it what you like. I've never saw those words. Okay. There's not enough hubris in me to say eight, anything eight, like eight, that. 883? 883, Your Honor. It's not, DX, is it empty? It is not admitted yet. Okay, 883. Mr. Depp, these are text messages from you to Stephen Duders on February 22nd, 2017, correct? Um... This, no, this looks nothing like me. You might have mistaken. Uh... Mr. Depp, we can show the full unredacted. You've looked at a number of text messages in this case, and the words him as the identifier, that's you, correct? In every text message we've seen in this case. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. It yeah. still doesn't mean it hasn't been screwed with. That's not anything that I've ever said or written. You want to see the whole the whole thing unredacted? We can look at that too. No, it's because you could have typed it up last night. No. Yeah. I can assure you I didn't type it up last night, Mr. Depp. Your Honor, I move for the admission of Exhibit 883. All right, any objection? Uh, objection on relevance grounds, Your Honor. All right, well, do you want to approach for a moment? Yes. Let's take a look. All right, I haven't, I haven't done one first, so I'll go first on this one. Uh, this is where it all changes. So his voice tone goes a little bit higher. His cadence speeds up. His eye contact with the, with the attorney is almost fixed. And his voice is a little bit louder. And these are all indications, again, that he's on alert, that he's paying close attention to what he's saying, what he's doing. His lips are pursed, and that, that indicates disagreement or something he's, he's not into, something he doesn't like, or hearing something he doesn't like. Um, and, to, and, and usually you look at that and say, oh, when you see uh, pursed lips, there's an issue there. That's what you want to think when you see something like that. Uh, as he explains, there's not enough hubris in him to say that that um, that that's him in the text or that he wrote those texts. We see a lot of lip person at that point. The definition of hubris is excessive pride or self-confidence and arrogance, which is he's coming across with a lot of that. But I think it's I don't. I don't think it's working against him. I think he's he's pulling it off in a lot of parts at that point. But since he's like that, and I think all of his everybody would assume he's like that, he's got to kind of own that a little bit. And I think he does. So he's he because he's aware as he, that he comes off as prideful and arrogant, and that's why he smiles a lot. To try to tamp that down. I think. All right, Mark, what do you got? I think this is the most on the ropes that we've probably seen him throughout the whole trial so that might tell us something about about his character first of all but also you know how much evidence he thinks is stacked against him and what the type of evidence he feel he gets most stressed out by yeah we see these bites at the side of the mouth we see lip pursing so this is more stress than we normally see from him um, still, the use of the poetic words like you use there, Scott, hubris, instead of using confidence or pride, he still has. He's not so stressed out that he still can't grab a, grab a word like, like hubris. Um, so that's the poet there. You know, it's interesting, right at the start, could you repeat that? Could you repeat that, please? That is the most I've heard him sound like John Lennon. And then he went on, I think, the next night or the night after to play in Sheffield with Jeff Beck and sing Isolation, which is a John Lennon uh, song. Not particularly well, actually, in my opinion. But then he was up against Jeff Beck, who's a genius on the guitar, and Johnny Depp is not a genius on the guitar uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But nonetheless, uh, 
interesting to hear that John Lennon uh, clearly coming through there, from my opinion. I think he's genuinely has some confusion about the 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 evidence at some point. It, it may well be confusion around that, that it's just confusing for him. He has never seen anything like this before, or he's genuinely confused by being surprised by it. I'm not quite sure which one. Anyway, all I'd say at the end of this is, I don't think the lawyer there does the best job of really uh, you know, nailing this down because he said, I assure you, I did not type it up last night. Well, that just doesn't discount then that he didn't type it up on some other night or somebody else didn't type it up last night or on another night. I think if I were the lawyer, I'd have tidied that one up to say it's it's real evidence. It's the real thing. That's your, you know, that's your text yeah. message. I wouldn't have tried to qualify it in that way. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, this is one where he is indeed on the ropes. And I think what's happening here is, if you think about this as a chess match, if he admits that he sent some drug fueled or drunken text that said this, how does that make him look? Now that lets them set up the next the next pawn in the chess match. So I think that starts, he realizes that now something's going to be used against him. He's going to have a hell of a time backing out of because his text came from his phone. Here we are back to a video coming off somebody else's phone. And he, not unlike, not unlike Amber, is also in the audition for his career. If the world finds out or thinks and he walks away from here and they believe he's this monster she's made him out to be, he's done. He's done. We see what happened to him in the past. So he has to be very cautious as well. His blink rate is through the roof. We don't see that usually in him. He's very stoic in blink rate. He also, his target is shrinking. His body is shrinking. He's turtling. He's getting smaller. Scott, you hit it dead on. His, his eye contact is sustained throughout the whole thing. Hard eye contact. He goes to internal voice, but he doesn't search for change over on the right before he answers. And then he says a new word, ludicrous, ludicrous. Now, maybe he said it during other times, but we didn't hear it. He uses it twice here, equally ludicrous. And he is emphatic when he does that. And he telegraphs with his cadence by saying equally ludicrous, purses his lips in disapproval at pushing forward. And then he is talking with that downward tone from the back of his throat. Then he does a disclaimer, likely for the good of the jury to say, there's no way I would do anything like that. I don't have a hubris. But then when they show him the actual text, watch his face. Everybody out here, all of you can recognize the shock. We all know what shock is because Darwin, all those years ago, figured out it was a universal emotion that we can all read. Once he does that, you see an O, then he narrows his mouth and his body language gets a little more rigid. You can hear him breathe. His breathe, breathing rate increases, you can hear him breathe. And then you see that grief muscle come up and he starts to navigate the answer. No, these aren't, he says, this looks, looks nothing like me. Well, if I'm interrogator, I'm saying, well, hold on, I didn't ask you if it looks like you. I'm asking, did you write this? You see the mouth grooming you mentioned, Mark, because he's feeling the stress. And this is starting to build up on him. An interrogator should jump on him and go after him and say, is it possible you don't remember? You just said you didn't remember something five minutes ago, and that would be my approach. He's on the ropes here, and this is a place where he actually could look very, very, very bad because he's saying something that they can make him into a different person. I think he's feeling the stress. Chase, what do you got? You guys got most everything, and I agree. Uh, but one thing we do see in here that we rarely see, especially in the courtroom, is a retreat of the dominant shoulder. And we see this as the subject gets brought up. If you try to get yourself, if you're just listening to this while you're chopping cucumbers in your kitchen or whatever, just pull your pull your, that dominant shoulder back. And that's how we get into a uh, like a fighting position. So that's one of the pre-violence indicators if we're on the street as a cop, but it's an anger indicator or disagreement indicator, especially in situations like this. And I think the level of confidence that we see, I think he initially doubts that he said these things. I do believe that he doubts that he said it. He likely sent these texts, but now he's going to go, has to go into this defensive mode. You see his blink rate spikes and, and drops Exactly. You can watch in this video go up and down, up and down, exactly how we describe it with stress and focus. You can watch it in this one clip. And this is what to look for, not, not to say someone is lying, but to identify the special context where more questions are needed. And in the overall sense of things, if you just think about the in trial in its entirety, if this is the one thing that got him on the ropes, 
it should tell you a whole lot about who he is and what all we're dealing with between him and his ex-wife. That's all I got. All right. Well, let's throw it down the room in 30 seconds or less. Let's kind of wrap it up and talk about what we think we've seen here. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, I guess thinking about all of that, I just kind of think who's having to work harder here? Who's having to work harder? Who's putting in more effort here visibly? I'm not saying somebody couldn't be paddling hard underneath and it not really showing, but who's really showing that they're putting in more effort here to the jury, uh, emotionally? Um, and and do we think that's going to have the impact that they desire? Well, we're going to find out uh pretty soon i guess chase what are your thoughts from an academics perspective if just looking at this stuff from academics is you're going to see something that i call a laboratory blind spot we can't isolate everything inside of a lab and you're definitely going to see that here but on, on the overall where is the abuse shame being ashamed of something turns the volume down on false accusations and pain turns the volume up for truthful accusations, in my opinion. I think we're seeing an actress and not a storyteller. People who write really good fiction know one thing very well. The main character needs a deep character flaw to make them likable. Nobody enjoys a perfect character. Look at every superhero movie, every Disney movie. There's flaws in every main character. And this was a case of a flawless, innocent, perfect human who's never made a mistake versus the most vile villain that ever existed. It's just bad storytelling. That's all I got. Greg? Yeah, I would start this off by saying my wrap of this, the entire series, is this is a train wreck and a trash dump. This is a horrible, horrible story, no matter how we look at it. And it looks like the story of a brawler, in my opinion, the brawler and an insecure, druggy kind of guy, a guy who uses substance to for whatever reason, whether it's recreation or whatever, those two people might not match very well together. And I'm not sure which side is honest. I will say this, that she is hard to believe and she's hard to like when you're looking at her and the way she approaches things. Her emotions, her most ramped up emotions, to your point, Chase, about anger, are around when she's disrespected, when I would think I would be really angry about the violation of person, of self, all the physical violence. It just doesn't show the same. He likely also has moments where he doesn't remember things because if he's drinking that much or doing that much, we can't tell. But if any of what she said is true or half of what he said is true, maybe he does send these texts and those kind of things. Almost all he said, she said stories are gonna be one side or the other, you know, a little bit in the middle. It's not going to be, none of it's going to be true. It's going to be half truths. But she swung for the fences on this story. He's either an all out monster. I mean, the stuff she's accusing him of is not kind of he's a jerk. He's an all out monster if she's right, or she's a liar because she swung for the fence. They both have shown signs of deception. His has mostly been around stupid things like saying stupid stuff. He's shown some certain there, something he's written or he said. That leads me to believe. She's the one that's not believable. And if she swung that hard for the fence, we'll wait and see what the jury says. That's my opinion. Scott, what do you got? I think this is a great example of seeing, uh, like Chase was saying, seeing a story go along. The more th that you watch of this trial, <clears throat> the more you see the separation of she's really different than this guy. She, you know, she's really telling one story. He's really telling another story, as you would expect in this situation. But it sure looks like she's, I'm getting a lot more deceptive cues from her than I did from him. So when it comes to believing, if I had to put my money on it, I don't think it'd be uh, tough to, to say who showed the most uh, cues of deception in those two. So I think it's a great example of seeing people, we all the time, we're all the time talking about uh, trial and court and those types of things. I think it's a great example of just being able to sit there and watch these things we always talk about happen right in front of you. So, all right, fellas, I think this was a good one, and I'll see you next time. Deal. The behavior panel. <laughs> Objection. Objection. I knew her. <clears throat> she was my friend. All right. She was my friend. She was you my friend. You know the one objection that I never heard during this trial that I, I hear during every single trial? It's yeah, like, that's f it. What the f***, man? I'm not going to say it in the video, but it's objection call, calls for facts, not in evidence.
Yeah, yeah. There's a there, million there is of one, them. and there's one that they actually do that has facts, not in evidence. And they, part of it, Chase, I think, is because See, they're we're saying, missing out on this. Well, let's let's say it. Let's bring it up. We'll talk about it. Let's uh, put, yeah. at the end of our of our talk here. Let's bring that up and make it part of the <laughs> closing. Yeah, Chase, just throw it in, just like yeah, we were doing. Go. Save so, this. Always, this yeah. is the good stuff. That's, That's great. great. All right. I'll be sharing all my answers and I'll see the silhouette.